If your goal is to improve human health, mm -hmm. there really is no biological problem more important than the biology of aging. Every major cause of death and disability in every developed nation has age as its greatest risk factor. If you want to have an impact on human health, modifying the biology of aging is the way to go. My name is Matt Caberline, and welcome to the OptiSpan YouTube channel. So, hey everyone, welcome to the OptiSpan YouTube channel. It's my pleasure to have in-house today Kevin White from Prime Health Associates in Oklahoma City. Uh, so Kevin came to visit us in Seattle, and we're just going to sit and talk, and uh, I have no idea what's yeah. going to come out of this conversation, but it's going to yeah. be fun. Yeah, we were talking a bunch before, and you said, just shut up, let's just record yeah. this, and here we go. Yeah. So yeah, here at the OptiSpan mothership That's in right. Seattle. That's right. So... Uh, so you've got your own clinic in Oklahoma City. Um, I guess one question I've got is, do you do you consider what you do longevity medicine, health span medicine? Like how, how do you frame your clinic and, 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 and the type of medicine that you practice? Um, yeah, well, our, so our client, absolutely, uh, health span and lifespan, we look at both those things, but our patients, we reframe the way we view health in general as more of an investment than an actual reactionary, you know, thing. So, so our patients look at it like, what do I want to do when I'm 80, 90? How do I want to live like that? And what do we need to put in place now to make that happen? So right. we look at it, we, you know, we look at like an asset, you know, like, uh, you know, like, like they would their four one K yeah, or whatever. Like Warren yeah. Buffett says, your health is your greatest asset. Yeah. And almost nobody invests in it that yeah. way. Right. So, yeah. um, and I think, so you and I first met at the American aging association meeting in May. Yeah. I think it was. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so, so why, why did you go to that meeting? It's not typical, right. That a, a MD is going to go to a scientific meeting on the biology of aging. Yeah, that was just a, a rabbit hole I went down and I found myself there totally out of, out of, you know, like a goldfish in a whole room of <laughs> sharks, like we've said, but, but yeah, locally OMRF, which is Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation right. where I live. So we were, you know, our group made a donation to them. And then in the spring, that following spring, we went to kind of this event there where we got to be exposed to all the different research they were doing. And then there was a um, um, some research being done. You know, one of those areas was um, a guy doing research on metformin. Mm -hmm. He was talking about longevity and all that. Um, so, so I Is thought that, that ben, was interesting. Ben Miller? Yeah, yeah, yeah Ben from uh, Berkeley. And uh, so, so we had a nice conversation and we discussed, you know, about in this, in this area, you know, what good science is being done. He mentioned that, which was actually the next week or two. And, and he invited me to go. And so I looked it up and showed up and, and of course, you know, there you were on the panel discussion talking about, you know, what you were doing and then kind of shifting gears and uh, starting OptiSpan, which right. is more proactive. And, and I went up and said, Hey Matt, I really don't belong here, uh, <laughs> but I'm interested in what you're doing, and so yeah. there we go. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think you know, for me, it's been sort of an interesting journey, um, you know, transitioning out of pure academia now into more. I guess I would characterize OptiSpan as a healthcare technology company, but we have a clinical component, and mm -hmm. so really starting to think in a much more certainly translational, but I don't even know that translational really captures it clinical hands-on, what can we actually do for people today that will optimize their health span and mm -hmm. longevity over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a very different mindset. And so, I mean, I think it was, it was pretty cool that, you know, for me, because I was at that point where um, I knew that I was making this transition, I'd started to think in that way. Mm -hmm. And certainly over the last, you know, six months or seven months since that meeting mm -hmm. have, you know, gone off the deep end in, into this space. And um, it's just a different mindset when you go mm -hmm. from basic research to the completely the other end of the of the spectrum. Yeah. Um, and it's sort of interesting, you know, to look at the the different people who are out there, the different voices in this space. The There's a lot of um, people who were 
doing what I, I guess I would call executive health, concierge medicine, who are starting to rebrand themselves as longevity clinics, longevity medicine. Um, so there's a lot of people coming into this space. You sort of were, I guess, an early adopter in the sense that you really started to, um, on your own, branch out into longevity medicine, health span medicine before it was really a thing that I think people were talking a lot about. So maybe you can share a little bit about that, the origin story, right? This was, this was, I think you said like 2021 or so that you really first started your clinic independently. And yeah. well, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's non-traditional, right? You, yeah. so you were an ER doc at that yeah. time, right? So what kind of, what, what was that process like? Uh, the switch was inevitable, um, but it was just whenever you're working in, in the emergency room, there is, you know, everyone says, you know, you never know what you're going to get. You never know what's going to come in the door. That's kind of a lie. You always know what's going to come mm. in the door because always the same stuff over and over and over again. It's chronic metabolic disease or any, any nuance of that. And, um, you know, a lot of it has to do with lifestyle and, you know, so it's all the end of the game really. So that over and over, you get slapped with, in the face with that every day, it really kind of changes your thinking. Once you step back and you look at all the processes in the, in, in the health industry, yeah. it's all about fast reaction or, you know, whenever it comes to cardiovascular disease, it's, you know, time is part, you know, or the same thing with strokes. It's, you know, you set up your stroke teams and you do an excellent job, but it's very reactionary. Right. So, um, and I would imagine it's even more so in primary care, except it's not. So, so I, t correct me if I'm wrong, but this is sort of the way I would think about it, right? So the primary care docs are seeing this, you know, maybe once a year, somebody comes in and they kind of see this slow progression yeah. towards the critical event yeah. that then somebody's in the emergency room, yeah. right? And, but it's But there's no real steps taken prior to that critical event to prevent it from happening in the first place. Now that's a, obviously an overgeneralization, but I think you know oftentimes that's kind of the reality of the situation. There's very little done proactively, preventatively, mm -hmm. maybe outside of you know very basic lifestyle recommendations like you know you should stop drinking as much alcohol, stop smoking, mm -hmm. exercise more. You're almost a diabetic. Watch out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's not generalizing it to, that's actually spot on. You know, I, I still work in the emergency department, maybe a couple of days a month just to kind of, you know, stay involved in, in the community. And I see that, I just saw that, that I just saw that the other day, a guy came in, his blood sugar was, you know, 320 and he was And why did he come reason. to the emergency room? Oh, he was just just not feeling well, felt really weak, yeah. um, nothing very specific, um, had a little bit of nonspecific chest pain. Um, I mean, everything worked out, but he was, uh, I mean, he was a diabetic and he goes, yeah, he saw me a year ago and said that, you know, I just got to watch it and, you know, watch what I eat and everything. But he, he just had a, he was a real sugar fiend. Hmm. Um, and it's just too bad because there's a lot of things that can be done yeah. years before and they're not hard steps to take it's just knowing the score and knowing the cards you're dealt yeah anyway. yeah i was sort of shocked you know i uh, uh i'm wearing a cgm right now you guys can all see that uh i do that periodically i don't do it all the time but one of the first times i was wearing a cgm i was out and and i don't I, like i don't drink that much alcohol but we were out for a couple of beers with some friends and uh the friend you know, I, I was must have been wearing a short T-shirt like this, and he's like, "I see you have a CGM on. I have a CGM on too." And he's, he was a he was a type two diabetic, and and so he's like pulls out his phone and he's showing me the the Libre app or whatever, and his blood glucose like all day long was outside the normal range, <laughs> mm. and he's sitting there having nachos and beer, and I'm like, "What are you doing, man?" Mm. And he's like, "Well, if it gets up too high, I'll just take some insulin," and I'm like. But that's just, that's, that's the, that's normal. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, and I, so I was sort of shocked. That blew me away mm -hmm. that this is the way a lot of people, they, they think it's, it's okay mm -hmm. that it's, you know, that they're, they're managing their health in that state. And I, I just, I'd never experienced that before. So it just surprised me. And it's sort of astounding 
uh, how many things like that there are in, that we just accept in our current, you know, quote unquote, healthcare disease care system that really is, you know, very, very poor care for people. We were talking about vitamin D earlier. And, you know, the fact that here in Seattle, where we're at right now, probably 50% of the people out there are vitamin D deficient. Most medical professionals know this. And, and when I first, it's just relatively recently that I realized this, I was blown away. I'm like, I can't believe that our medical professionals let 50% of their patients walk around deficient for vitamin D and they don't do anything about it. They don't get a test for it. That's insane to me. Because it's just so stupid cheap too. Yeah, it's easy to fix, right? And the consequences of not fixing it on health span, I don't know what they are. I need to do the math. My guess is it's probably five to seven years of health span that you lose by being vitamin D deficient for a few yeah. decades. The cost is expensive of avoiding it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so if you think about, like, again, we talked about multiple sclerosis and vitamin D. Mm -hmm. It's very, very difficult to prove causality. Mm -hmm. In my view, the data are pretty clear that there is almost certainly a causal connection for at least a, a subset of MS cases being caused by vitamin D deficiency. So what, what would the economic savings be here? And, and again, in the Seattle Pacific Northwest, MS rates are very high, mm -hmm. abnormally high, probably because everybody's vitamin D deficient. <laughs> what would the economic savings be if we could prevent 10,000 MS cases a year? It's enormous, yeah. tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars for something that costs, I don't know, five bucks a month to supplement. I mean, it's just... But, but that's just one example of, you know, <laughs> what I, I think what I said when we talked about this earlier is, you know, that's not low hanging fruit. Yeah. That's the fruits rotting on the ground. It's so low. <laughs> you know, it, there's just so many ways that we can improve this system. And, you, and yet I think people get beaten down with how broken it is that nobody knows where to start. And, and so, um, so it's, this, that's something that obviously we're interested in, in having an impact on at Optispan. And, and I know that's, that's, part of your philosophy for why you, you know, have moved away from that type of medicine to something that is hopefully more proactive, more preventative, more about keeping people healthy rather than keeping people sick. Yeah. What made you jump off from the, the world of research into <laughs> this kind of, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think there, it was multifactorial. I think, uh, you know, I had been in academia for a couple of decades by that point. Um, I mean, the the precipitating event for me was I was sitting at a conference. Um, it wasn't the age conference that we were at. It was before that. But uh, I was at a conference and I sort of vividly remember, you know, looking around the room at my colleagues who were 10, 15, 20 years senior to me and asking myself, you know, do I want to be them mm -hmm. in 10, 15, 20 years? And the answer was, no. Right. 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 So I knew at that moment that I really needed to be looking for other opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and so I didn't immediately, you know, make the jump, but I opened myself to, you know, what else is out there? What might be possible? Took a look at a few different opportunities and then found one that I thought, you know, was the right fit for me that really gave me an opportunity to hopefully do something important and impactful. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so that's why I moved to Optispan and, and, you know, we're trying to build this, this, you know, kind of, kind of crazy, kind of, uh, and certainly ambitious, uh, initiative, you know, really our, our, what we call our BHAG, that's big, hairy, audacious goal is optimal health spans for everyone. Now, you know, do I really believe that we're going to be able to help everyone optimize their health span? No, but if we can even make a dent in that problem, yeah. That's really important. And so, you know, how we're going about doing that, that's a longer discussion. Um, but uh, but we want to also be able to be nimble and take advantage of opportunities in this space. But I do believe, I think we're aligned on this, that, you know, anything we can do to be proactive and help people take control of their own health um, will have an impact. And mm -hmm. so really thinking about, opportunities there to engage, inform, empower people to be able to, to take control of their own health and guide them on that path towards health span optimization. That's where we want to be. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I feel very fortunate to have gotten into this. I'm uh, having a blast, learning a ton, but also it's very different from what I was doing before, which I also was important. Like I, I my basic research on the biology of aging, I don't regret any of that. 
uh, and and I believe that there's huge value in that that field. Um, but it's very different. It's kind of the other end of the spectrum to actually be able to see in real people having an impact on their health. And when you're working, I'm sure you, you I'm sure you you've experienced this many many times. You know, I've never worked with patients before, right? I'm not an MD, but within our program, seeing people improve their health and the impact that that has on them, my own personal experience of learning about my own health, improving my own health, seeing the impact that has on my family, my loved ones, when they see me doing it and they act on that, Mm -hmm. it's hugely rewarding. And so it's just, I feel very fortunate to be in the position I'm in now to to be able to have that experience. The one thing that, I mean, you said you never worked with patients. Well, doctors have never worked alongside a scientist yeah it's sort of a unique it's a cool yeah yeah, uh, i i don't know of any other any other operation that has that kind of that kind of setup the one thing that i realized and at that age conference that i was the only clinician in that i knew of um conversations are a lot different on the you know yeah in the breakouts but um the one thing i realized is that everything we do in the clinical setting does not happen without what you guys do on the research side. And that goes for every aspect of medicine in general. The yeah. interesting thing that I found is we're learning about all this stuff and they're talking about the nuances of, you know, visceral adipose tissue and how it, you know, affects T cells and all that sort of thing. Um, there's a huge chiasm between that information being discovered and you know, you know, figured out and then going to bedside and actually being put into place. And there's just such a delay in that whole process. And I, that's the, that's the cool thing about having you here. It's like, Hey, we can streamline that and do some (laughs) stuff. Well, yeah. And I mean, you're right. There is, there is a delay there. It is a long process to go from the laboratory, especially when you start from the very basic, you know, say cell based type of research to, to get to the clinic. Yeah. I, it's an interesting question, um, you know, how much of that is necessary, right? I think it is important, obviously, that we don't rush too fast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and it's inter- And I say that particularly because I think in this space, in the longevity space, just sort of nebulous what we mean when we say the longevity field, because it encompasses a lot. But I think within the longevity field, you know, there is sometimes a rush to extrapolate from the basic research to humans very quickly among at least the sort of biohacker crowd, for lack of a better better way of framing it. And so I think that that um, process is important, that, it, that things are vetted, that we understand the way they're working somewhat mechanistically, that we validate that something that, you know, has an effect in nematodes and then in mice actually has the same effect in people before we start using it in people. That's important. Mm-hmm. But the flip side of that is, and I, I definitely fall in the camp where I am of the opinion that the regulatory process as it exists today slows things down way too much to get into clinical use. And I mean, in, in particular, the FDA drug approval process, but, but that whole culture that's been built up of, you know, the way that pharmaceutical companies develop drugs, the way they test them, the way they move them into the human uh, uh, market, I think that whole system has, has created a structure that both takes far longer than it needs to and also favors drugs that have very incremental effects. Um, It's much more about, you know, demonstrating safety and working through the the box checking that the bureaucratic system requires uh, rather than does your drug actually move the needle? Mm -hmm. Really, the goal is approval. You don't really have to move the needle in terms of efficacy to get a drug approved with FDA under the current guidelines. So, you know, it's a, it's a complicated, I don't know where that middle ground is, but I do feel like today, uh, at least for the drug development process, it's skewed too far towards taking too long, costing too much, and creating medicines that don't actually work that well. Now, not everything is true. Like, I think you could point to the the GLP-1 agonists, right, as drugs that really do move the needle, at least for obesity. Um, But in general, most of the drugs that get approved really don't do much. Yeah. Except cost a lot and potentially bankrupt Medicare. Hey, everyone. If you'd like to check out part two of this podcast, head on over to the link below.